Paul Boven from uh, the LBI uh, uh, from Netherlands. He will speak about uh, the LBI, Juno Radio, uh, and the White Rabbit. Okay, thank you. What I'll be presenting is work we've done over the past uh, four years, roughly. Uh, my name is Paul Boven, uh, call sign Papa Echo One November Uniform Tango. And as you might see at the slides, I actually have two affiliations next to my name, and we'll get to that. Uh, the thing that, of course, draws the attention is the very large dish you see over there. That's the Dwingelo Radio Telescope. It's a national monument nowadays, and it is run by volunteers. It's no longer in use by the original owner. And we're going to do some uh, new radio and some VLBI with it. So that's a pretty big dish, and if actually, for a 25 meter dish, it's easy to calculate that at one and a half gigahertz, you have a beam width of half a degree, the size of the full moon, which is incredibly small for an antenna. But on the other hand, it's actually really poor. Full moon is one pixel. And if you go up in frequency a bit, like uh, five gigahertz, it gets a bit smaller. But compare that, for instance, to a much smaller telescope, Hubble Space Telescope is only a tenth of the size. Still, the resolution is 10,000 times, 10, times better. <coughs> so to have an equivalent resolution, you would need to size the dish up to 250 kilometers, which is a bit much. There's a solution, however, which is called very long baseline interferometry, and that at least explains one of the acronyms in this talk. So very long baseline interferometry is where you take radio telescopes all over the world you basically face them up together as a phased array, um, and you start doing your astronomy with that. On the left, the Joint Institute for VLBI in Europe is the organization that takes all that data, processes it, correlates it. It's also my employer. And the organization itself is called the European VLBI Network. And as you can see from the map, we take European quite wide. It goes as far as uh, Arecibo and South Africa and Rus Russia and China. So how does this work? Um, we make a virtual radius telescope almost the size of the Earth. The actual size of your virtual telescope becomes comparable to the longest distance between uh, the two any two telescopes. And that gives you resolution not of half a degree or something, but on the order of a milli arc second or even better. And you do this by all looking at the same source with all those telescopes at the same time. Now, before you can actually do, what, do anything with it, you have quite a bit of Doppler because the Earth is rotating. And if you were to stand on the equator, you might not notice, but you're moving around at 465 meters per second. That gives you quite a bit of Doppler shift. So we need to take that out. And then we do a complex cross-correlation between any pairs of telescopes. And that gives us the phase on that particular baseline. And the number of baselines sort of goes up with the square of the number of telescopes. So adding more telescopes um, gives you many more baselines where you're actually measuring the signal. These measurements we express in U and V coordinates, which are in wavelengths, and we put them in something called the UV plane, and then as the Earth rotates and all the baselines between the telescopes rotate, you start filling up the UV plane in sort of semi-arcs, and after 12 hours that starts to repeat because the baseline has completely flipped around. So what you do then is you can start and create a dirty image by just doing an inverse FFT of, of, the, uh, of the data that you have. But that gives you what we call a dirty image because actually there's many points in the UV diagram where you didn't have a telescope where you don't have data. So you have to make up a lot of the data. And then we have very, very difficult algorithms that actually try and get the best possible image out of, out of that. <coughs> now here are some of the examples what you can actually do with VLBI. On the left is a pretty famous image that came out recently where at, I think, 280 gigahertz, uh, the EHT co consortium used VLBI to map the first event horizon of a black hole. The one on the right, uh, we don't have enough resolution to show it properly. Um, it is extremely finely detailed. It is actually a galaxy, uh, or at least an active radio source behind another source, and it is, the light is bent around it due to the gravity. So we're not seeing the foreground source, we're seeing the source behind it, and the fact that you get sort of a ring, which is called an Einstein ring, is due to the way how the light, or actually the radio signal, was bent around the foreground source. 
So what do you need to do some VLBI? You need a radio telescope, and of course, the bigger, the better. You can't do VLBI with one telescope. You need at least two. Uh, but again, if you have more, that's better. Each radio telescope needs a very stable frequency reference, where in a phased array, normally everything can run off the same clock. You cannot have the same clock over here and on a different continent. Um, the stability that you need is, say, you're observing at 10 gigahertz, then over a thousand seconds, you do not want the phase of that 10 gigahertz signal to appreciably, be, appreciably change. So you need very high stability in the order of 10 to the minus 14. Uh, for longer observation times, actually what starts happening is that the turbulence in the ionosphere or the troposphere starts to destroy the coherence between the stations. Um, we can still observe longer, but then you have to do tricks like phase referencing, where you look at the source, you look at the calibrator, you look at the source for five minutes, calibrator five minutes, you go back and back forth and back and forth, and you do that for 12 hours. The sensitivity for this depends crucially on the bandwidth that you have. And if you have four times as much bandwidth, you have twice as much sensitivity. So we try to do this with high bandwidth. Uh, so you have to imagine the number of baselines that you form goes up as the uh, square of the number of stations, and then you're doing this with high bandwidth. So you need some real horsepower to process all these cross-correlations, to do all these averaging. Um, and that's called a correlator, and we run the EVN correlator. Uh, is being run by Jive. Now, to actually phase up things uh, to a fraction of a wavelength, you don't just need to know, you, you need to know very accurately their location on the Earth, but also very accurately how the Earth is rotating, um, how the tides are actually moving the telescopes around, because tides don't just happen to water, but actually the surface that we're on goes up and down up to 40 centimeters twice a day. You wouldn't notice, because everything around you does the same, but if you go a quarter of an Earth further, you get the opposite effect. So all of these effects need to be taken out until you're at the order of a wavelength in order to actually be able to do this correlation. So this telescope I've already mentioned is the Dwinglo Radio Telescope. Um, it, it, uh, it was opened in 1956. It's a 25-meter dish with a 7.7-millimeter steel mesh wire surface. So that, that these two parameters basically already set the frequency range, so it's going to be somewhere around 100 megahertz up to 8 gigahertz. When you go beyond 8 gigahertz, the photons get so small that they start to fall through, through the mesh. It's 120 tons. It's a historic monument. We're extremely careful, careful with it. Um, and it's operated nowadays by volunteers, and I'm one of those volunteers. The organization is called Camras, and you can uh, have a look at their website. We also have pages in English. And what we do is, first of all, we try and maintain the instrument, improve it. We also do radio astronomy. We do all kinds of ham radio activities, including moon bounce. Uh, we do education and outreach. Uh, yeah, moon bounce with a 25-meter dish is kind of easy. <laughs> um, we, we have a SETI project. We have ver various art projects. There's qu quite a lot of going on. It's a very fun club to be a member of. So I said earlier, you need a lot of bandwidth. And actually, the bandwidth scales as the square law of the, sorry, the sensitivity squares with the, the sensitivity scales with the, see that's what, you, what I get when I try to hurry. The sensitivity scales with the square root of the bandwidth. And that means you run into limits in either your network throughput or in your storage capacity. And so you want to store your samples or represent them as efficiently as possible. And of course, using fewer bits for your samples means that you can have more samples. And the most extreme case of that would be only one bit per sample, but then you get a lot of quantization noise. And the trade-off surprisingly ends up pretty close to only two bits per sample. So almost all VLBI is done at only two bits per sample resolution. And imagine just you're having a noise signal, and these are basically the bit where you want like a third of the area to be one bit, a third of the other, and then one sixth for the outliers. That gives you kind of the best sensitivity. And that also means that if you are reducing your data to two bits, you actually have to have an AGC or something like that to keep it in that range. And then at a much lower rate, you do a power measurement so you actually know um, uh, how much energy was coming in. Now, two-bit quantization sounds easy. It's not, turns out. There are at least two styles of doing rounding, and actually there's many more. Uh, there's the C-style rounding, which is basically truncation, 
where anything between minus one and plus one becomes a zero, which is not what you want in signal processing because you got a, uh, you basically got one bit that is twice as big as an, any other bit. And in signal processing, we usually do minus and half to plus and half, that becomes a zero. And then the next stage, you get one, two, three, et cetera. And then it becomes a nice staircase function without any uh, strange plateaus in it. So GNU Radio would usually do it the right way. But when I was trying to get my VLBI stuff going, I, I noticed sometimes I get really strange results. And that led to my first uh, new radio, no, I'm not sure to call it a contribution, but a bug report. And what you, what you see on the graph there is I graphed, I basically put random values in the radio, and I made a graph of all the values that uh, were rounded down to zero. And you see normally it is nicely behaved between minus and a half and plus and a half, but every now and then it runs between minus one and two one. And what you also see, it's very periodic. And it turns out, and um, Marcus uh, Muller over there was the guy uh, who helped a lot with this and figured out what was going on. A lot of the heavy lifting in GNU Radio is done in the vector, or, or, vector optimized library of kernels. And, you, and that makes use of the, uh, of the high performance instructions on your, on your CPU, like SSE. And you feed a lot of samples at the same time, but there are some leftovers at the end of a GNU Radio uh, uh, packet, and they would then be done in C because they wouldn't fit in the next SSE block. Yeah, yeah, it took this took a while to figure out. Um, 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 nah, <laughs> I'm sure there's been a more stupid one. And it, apparently, it, it had gone unnoticed for a very long time. But because I was actually only trying to find. Uh, values between 0, 1, 2, and 3. These were the only values I, I was allowing. It, it kind of stood out. But you just change the block size then to the uh, If you end up with a block size that is a multiple uh, of the Volk size, then possibly that might fix it. Yeah. So I already said high bandwidth. Um, we're actually using a twin RX that has an output of 2 times 80 megahertz. Uh, which is sampled over sampled at 80 at, at 100 megahertz. Um, the most efficient way to record it is 16 bits, even though it's 12 bit data, but that gives you 3.2 gigabits coming out of your backend, out of your SDR. Now, if you record that to the memory of your PC, that's easy, but then it's full in 10 seconds. And that's not quite what we're looking for. So I started recording this data to disk and I ran into a world of trouble. Uh, it immediately starts losing packets, crashing, stopping. Um, and then I found a tool, it's called GR Analysis, and GR Analysis itself has a recording called SpecRack for spectrum recording. And that works a little bit better because it's not as bursty as, uh, as the, the regular GNU radio tools. It puts all the samples in like a circular buffer and they get flushed to disk really regular so it doesn't save up a lot of samples and then dump it because then all of a sudden your system is very busy with your disk controller and then it forgets about the network controller and it misses packets. Unfortunately, when it runs out of this circular buffer, it just goes, oh, I'm done. Um, and it is really not trivial to record even only 50 mega sample, uh, even on a very beefy serv server with 18 disks in parallel. We managed to sometimes get it running for hours, but very often it would like crash like half after half an hour, and we had no idea why. So there's uh, lots of room for improvement. Another issue I ran into is that new radio basically supports two kinds of uh, timing. You can uh, have a GPS receiver in your, in your USRP, and then you can just tell it, set your time from GPS. Or you can use the external 10 megahertz and a one PPS, and then you got this little drop down that says unknown PPS, and then it waits for the PPS, and then it starts at that point, but then it sets the time to zero, which is somewhere in 1970, um, which is not what I was looking for, because I need accurate timestamps on my data. So this is actually listed somewhere in the knowledge base, but what you should do is you w wait for a PPS edge. And then actually, because the PPS edge and your PC time might not be perfectly aligned, you wait a bit more. Then you read out the PPS time, and you put that um, to your USB, but you don't say, now it is this time. No, you say, at the next beep, it will be this time plus one second. Um, and then you wait for the half, half of a second that is remaining. And then you have apparently set the right time to your USRP. So I implemented the code you see over there in uh, UHD RXC file and later on also in, uh, in the SpecRack software. 
So I was listing a number of things that you need for, uh, for doing VLBI, and one of them is you need a very stable and accurate clock. And these hydrogen masers, they run at about 200,000 to 300,000, which as a volunteer organization, we cer certainly don't have. But some of you might already have heard of White Rabbit. And White Rabbit is an open protocol, an open standard for distributing frequency and time. It was invented at CERN, and they were nice enough they made it an uh, open standard. And they use it for beam control for the, uh, for the LHC, for, for getting all of that in time. And originally, it was for 10 kilometer reach. That's the design. And you could do thousands of nodes up to a nanosecond. Well, up to a nanosecond can still be several phases, so that's not quite good enough for us. Uh, and also 10 kilometers, the distance between radio telescopes tends to be a lot more. So we started to tinker with White Rabbit and try and improve it a bit. And this actually became part of the Asterix uh, project, which is a, a Horizon 2020 research project from the EC, which is about bringing together astrophysics, particle astrophysics, astronomy, and they all have similar challenges about large amounts of data, about timing, distribution timing. There was also a work package on citizen science, but we worked on the Cleopatra work package uh, where lots of different research into White Rabbit was happening. And the end result of that was, uh, because this could be a complete separate talk and we don't have the time, the end result of that is that we have the Westerbork Synthesis Radio Telescope at the right, which is a professional Dutch radio telescope. They have a very good hydrogen maser. Then over here we have a White Rabbit switch and then from Westerbork to Dwingelo is 35 kilometer by fiber. And that wasn't actually really challenging. So we take a little detour. We go from Westerbork, we go to Groningen over 65, sorry, 67 kilometer fiber optical amplifier. And then we go back to Westerbork and then over Surfnet we go to Dwingelo. So that in total is a 169 kilometer link. And we had all kinds of improvements. These are special white rabbit switches with um, high stability, with low, low jet daughter boards. Um, we're using not the standard cheap optics that you have, but we're actually using frequency stabilized um, lasers. So, you, so the laser wavelength doesn't change that much. And it has a huge improvement for the sensitivity, sorry, not the sensitivity, for the stability of the clock signal that you get out of there. And the goal here was to show, can we actually get close enough to a maser to do VLBI? Um, so we had this little detour of 67 kilometer north and then back south again, and we measured the LN deviation. And this is a little bit of a complicated graph. We'll concentrate it on the left half, which is the LN deviation. And what you see here in red and then continued into blue is the actual performance of the link. Um, most of the other lines here don't really matter. You can read it at your leisure later on. But the black line is actually the, the performance from the sales brochure of a hydrogen maser. So basically everywhere between one second and say a thousand seconds, we are within an order of magnitude from the, from the maser and then we actually start to get even better. So being within an order of magnitude from a hydrogen maser is actually good enough to do VLBI if you're not doing it at too high a frequency. So we started doing VLBI, and this is where GNU Radio comes in. We had an Atis X310 with Twan RX motherboard, um, and then you need to do a lot of signal processing to actually get it into the format that is used for VLBI data. So I'll quickly run you through the flowchart. We start with the recorded data. Well, this is something everyone should know. You make it complex. And then, because it's 80 megahertz oversampled at 100 megahertz, the first thing I did was a resampler of 5 by 4. So now we're sampled at 80 megahertz. And then what we do is we actually shift it by 8 megahertz uh, by, adding a so by having a sign and multiplying with it. And then we put it in a polyphase channelizer, and that gives me five channels, five frequency bands. And by first shifting the little bit, uh, the band edges actually come together in the same band, and I just throw them away here in the null sync. And that leaves me with four bands of 16 megahertz each. Now, each band goes through the same three steps. We double the sample rate, uh, we shift it up, and then we throw away the imaginary part. And this is basically converting it from complex sampled at 16 megahertz to real sample data at 32 megasample per second. So we've got four sub bands coming out of here. And then we go through them. We take uh, 
32,000 samples of one, and of next, and next, and next, and then we return. And that's because the packet size is 8,000 bytes. And now we get to the part that was a bit of a headache, which is how do I turn these floating point numbers into two-bit numbers? And because of the bug I ran into, it, it's done in two steps. First, I go from float to char, but I use the whole 255, 255 range that's available. And then using a map function, I basically generate a little lookup table that turns it into a two-bit number. And then we have only one custom block in this whole flow chart, which is called VDIF packetize, that takes these two-bit samples, puts them together into a byte, adds timestamp, adds the uh, station indicator, um, and adds the channel number, and then we go back to a file. And this is coming soon to GitHub, if you want to play with it yourself. And that actually, in August last year, led to the very first fringes again for the Dwingelo telescope, the very first VLBI observation, except that it wasn't. It already did VLBI in 1978. But after that, the VLBI went to the bigger telescope, to Westerbork, and this thing did other signs and eventually got disused and got adopted by amateurs. But now we can do VLBI again. There were still some issues back then. Uh, like I said, we could only record to memory for ten, uh, at first, so it was only 10 seconds. And actually, running the flow graph that you see here as a background, um, I can run it on, on a brand new i1900 at 20% of real time. So if you do an hour of observing, you have five hours of calculating to do. And that's for only 256 megabit. What I actually wanted is uh, a full 1024 megabit. Also, for this very first test, we didn't use the hydrogen maser yet. Uh, we had to use a rubidium time base. The reason for that is that we were missing 270 meters of fiber between the Astron offices and the radio telescope. Uh, Astron was kind enough to donate some leftover fiber. This is 510 meters of 144 strand fiber, and 144 fibers is excessive, but the price was impossible to beat. So we started to plan, run around the telescope, into the woods, into the building, 100 meter inside the building. We rented the digger, we had some real fun with our volunteers actually digging the trench, putting the, the conduit in. The, the green conduit is special, uh, is special fiber conduit. And then, of course, on a rainy day, somewhere in uh, January or February, we actually started pushing the fiber through, through that conduit. And it might be surprising, but you can actually just by hand, uh, by adding a bit of lubrication, you can just push fiber through over 120 meters of conduit. And if you keep pushing, it gets up to speed. And if you stop, there is so much mass moving, it actually starts pulling itself forward. Uh, the other thing we had to do is, it's a radio telescope, it rotates, and that's not something you want to do to single mode fiber. So one of our volunteers designed and constructed this very nice uh, cable wrap so that in the one and a half rotation that the telescope can do, we never put too much stress on the fiber. And then, because we like challenges, we ended up splicing around fiber as well. So far we've done 24 out of 144. You have to imagine for a um, hobbyists like us, doing 24 fibers takes a full day, and you have to do it at the beginning of the fiber, in the middle where it goes into the telescope is another day, and then inside the telescope is another full day. But we have 144 fibers, so there's plenty of room for expansion. And what we end up with is this. This is actually inside the Faraday cage, inside the telescope. Um, this is a white rabbit switch, and into it you get fiber, which actually runs all the way to the Westerbork telescope, either by 35 kilometers of fiber or 169 kilometers of fiber. Uh, we have some optical filters, uh, and this is the Atus X310, and I actually managed to borrow an extra one so that we could compare them at the same time. And we were actually getting a little bit in a crunch. We were getting close to the end of the project, and it was about time to show that it worked. And we had a very good opportunity coming up. The uh, European VLBI network runs a network monitoring experiment in front at the start of every observing session where all the telescopes participate. You look at a bright, boring, uh, compact source and then you see if your fringes are any good. So we asked if you could join. Uh, unfortunately, um, that network doesn't usually operate at the frequencies that the Dwingelo telescope works at. So it's 19 of them, one of us. So we actually had to take the elevator, go up into the receiver and install new LNAs at wind force six. Uh, 
which was no fun. Uh, but this actually led to the very first time that we had fringes on a remote maser over White Rabbit. And this was not just a 10 second observation, we had now solved most of the recording problems, so this ran for 10 minutes, it ran for hours. And then if you start looking at your data, you start seeing funny stuff. If you set a frequency on your USRP, it is not actually the exact frequency. It's accurate to about a hertz, but you can be a little bit off. And if you're integrating a signal for 10 minutes, uh, or even just 10 seconds, that starts to add up. And we, we were seeing like a fringe, like it was good for like eight seconds, and then the ninth second it was gone, and then we came back. And that's because we had sort of phase jumps, because unlike all these professional telescopes, we were a little bit off with our frec frequency, which we managed to correct in software. The other thing, because this was all a little bit short notice, uh, we installed these new LNAs. They had a lot, slightly less gain. We had slightly more cable damping. Um, we, we, we didn't quite have enough gain. Still, we got a very nice cross-correlation peak. So on this axis, you see different possible time offsets that you try. You, you measure the cross-correlation. And only if you get all these time offsets really right, and, you, and they keep being right for the whole uh, 10 seconds or whatever you're calculating, then you get a nice, very sharp peak. And actually, the amplitude and the complex value of the peak, that is what goes into the next stage of VLBI. So what we actually ended up doing is using VLBI to verify the link performance to show that we could actually do VLBI with this. Uh, the black line is the same line you, show, you, you saw earlier, was the loopback line, the performance. The two other lines are doing VLBI between the Westerbork telescope and the Dwingelo telescope on a very strong source. Um, once over the 35 kilometer link in purple and once over the 169 kilometer link. And basically, I don't have error bars on this yet, but we have many more of these observations. There are no real difference between here and here. It, it, it looks like there's a little bit of difference, but I also have observations where it's the other way around. And after that, it starts to sort of uh, deviate. This is where the ionosphere becomes turbulent, where actually you lose coherence, not because your clock is bad, but because um, the ionosphere is, becomes unpredictable. And the, the other factor that you have is your source is not a perfect point source, so that starts to add up to, to your image as well. And now we get to the uh, part that I uh, should have actually skipped. Um, like I said, the flowchart was only doing it at uh, one-fifth of real time. Uh, the output, if we're doing one full channel from a 20rex, 3.2 gigabit per second. The actual output that we get out of the flowchart is only 256 megabit per second. So I wanted to try and offload all the processing to the FPGA. And GNU Radio has this very nice facility for this called RFNOC. And we've got the X310 X because it has 1540 multipliers, so you can actually put some filtering in there. So what you see over here is the flowchart sort of that I made into RFNOC. So this is again is where you get your samples. 100 mega samples, we do the same thing. We bring it down to 80 mega samples. And now instead of doing a polyphase filter bank, I opted to have four digital down converters. So I mix it with minus 24, minus eight, etc. So all offset by 60 megahertz. And then resample it, fractional resampler again, this time five to one. Um, and that gives me 16 megahertz of bandwidth. Then I should quantize it to two bits and I need this AGC. I should interleave them and then I should add the actual VDIV header and the timestamp. Um, but as you can see, those are actually in dotted lines, so I haven't gotten around to implementing that, and at the moment my FPGA is getting pretty full. So that's gonna take some time to make it more efficient, to actually make it fit. But it's gonna be a real challenge to do four TwinRx outputs on one X310, push that through the FPGA, even though it only outputs a lousy gigabit at the end. So that brings me to the conclusions. We built a working VLBI backend thanks to GNU Radio and just off-the-shelf SDRs, and that worked. We got fringes, and we were able to show that we can transfer a reference clock using White Rabbit over an existing production uh, DWM fiber network by using wavelengths that are not in use for the data traffic, so nobody had to lose their connectivity while we added this or tinkered with it. And the stability we get is good enough for doing VLBI, and I've calculated it should be good enough up to observing frequencies of about 12.4 gigahertz. And finally, we have not really been able to see performance difference. 
between a 35 kilometer link and a 169 kilometer link. So it should be possible to support longer links even. Thank you. Thank you very much, Paul. Uh, any question? Uh, yeah, you talked about a small tuning error of 0 0.187 hertz. Uh, is this due to a fractional uh, PLL or something like that, or is this uh, something else? Uh, yeah, it, it, it is partly fractional PLL. It is also the, the resolution of the DDS that does the tuning uh, in, in the final part. Um, within the flowchart, or actually no, uh, sorry, it's it's the DDS that's in the FPGA still, yeah. And I was running all these observations with uh, integer and tuning, uh, so that we didn't have extra phase noise due to um, due to the uh, DDS jumping around, etc. Sorry, I, I I don't know. I would have to look at that, yeah, the phase resolution. I don't know. Thank you for your presentation. So you have four channels uh, for uh, AOF channel, but you have only one channel for transport. Uh, so you, or you, you manage the, the passage for, from uh, four channels to one channel? Um, so the way the twin rigs works is that both channels are basically in sync. So um, you get them together in GNU radio, and then only the second motherboard is the other one. Um, and within either your flowchart or within GNU Radio, you can simply configure the, um, the source block to have two outputs. So that already gives you both outputs of a single Twenerix. And then the other two, you basically uh, synchronize them both to the same clock and you treat them separately and only at the interleaving block do you add them together. I, uh, thanks for your talk. I didn't uh, understood uh, where does the timestamp come from when uh, you showed uh, in your GNU radio design, uh, you show a block that uh, puts the timestamps before writing the samples to file. Yeah. Where does the timestamp come from? Uh, th this is all still very hackish, hackish, and I can actually show you. Uh, where's the flowchart? Yeah, here. Uh, actually, the VDIF packetized block has two parameters. And this first parameter is actually just a Unix timestamp. So I know when I'm going to observe. I start my recording at that time. And later on, I tell my, tell my flowchart, this was the time that recording started, and start counting forward from there. OK. OK. So this, this ties together with um, making it, the other half of it is making it actually start at the time they, that you want by setting the URCP to the correct time locked to the PPS and the 10 megahertz. So then you give your recording software a starting time and spec rec actually supports that. Um, and then later on you use the same time in your flow chart as a parameter. So have you looked at where you're, like you said, you didn't, couldn't do real time, you were down to 120th, so. Uh, where, where's all the time going? Where is, is the return resampler? Is it the polyphase? Um, so we're definitely losing quite a bit here. Yeah. Uh, because that's running at the highest rate, and I've actually, you know, re relaxed the, the 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 filter parameters quite a bit here to make it go at this speed. Um, I've actually done all kinds of tests where you know I I basically replaced parts of the flow chart with, with null sinks, etc. But the main culprit seems to be this one. Okay. Thanks. And then clearly th that one. <laughs>